Welcome. Um, I know there's a slight difference with this episode in that you can see us. Um, it is episode 10 and it's a visual one. Um, I am Ben Della Roche. Um, I'm on Yon. And our first visual guest is Cameron Berry. Hey. Oh god, I'm so lucky. <laughs> yeah, so lucky, so lucky. <laughs> um, we thought we'd do a little bit of a biopic episode. Uh-huh. Um, and that we would just go into the life of Cameron Berry and his sure. job at the moment. Cool. Which is uh, into the world of 3D scanning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. How far back do you want me to go? Um, no. a l- post fetus okay. and somewhere, yeah, anywhere in present day. Sure. Somewhere there. Okay, cool. Um, so I uh, came to New Zealand about 14 years ago uh, and started, effectively started high school here um, and didn't really know what I wanted to study, kind of like the idea of advertising or law uh, and then uh, ended up uh, picking advertising as my, um, my subject of choice. But uh, when I got to uh, design school to study advertising, I found that um, I wasn't really enjoying it as much as I thought I would. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, I, at the same time, I was studying 3D animation, and I actually really, really loved it. And then I, at that at that moment in time, I sort of committed to the 3D world as yep. the yeah. sort of thing for me. Um, got through uni, made a video game, did some all kinds of different uh, 3D related study. Um, but then after uni, uh, I did a couple of jobs here and there. Ended up working for a print shop. A print shop. Um, uh, <laughs> the print sh- <laughs> such a good like huh? <laughs> and then um, <laughs> so they they had uh, 3D scanners and then a 3D printer and I jumped onto that and made it my department uh, mm-hmm. and built that up over the course of probably a year and a half um, I was in the process of making a full body 3D scanner but there was a big fire and the, the whole building burnt down oh, really? and, yeah what it was, was that? Uh, um, they don't, uh, the, was it, was it? no one really knows exactly what happened. Uh, yeah. There's all kinds of theories, but um, I'm not sure what the current state of affairs is. Yeah. It's, a, it's a little bit of a sensitive subject, is, as you can imagine. This yeah. is such a good origin story. Like, yeah. the place burnt yeah. down yeah. and flaming wreckage and like, like yeah. a phoenix. <laughs> yeah, it ro- ro- rose out of the, the flames. Um, so I decided at that point to start my own company, uh, Z3D. Uh, providing 3D scanning as a service um, and I have sort of broadened the services that I offer to uh, not only 3D scanning but also fine art imaging for reproduction and uh, 360 photography. Um, those uh, those last two aren't really like my, my main priority yeah. but um, yeah 3D scanning is uh, it keeps me keeps me, me busy. I've been doing it for yeah. about a year and a half now. Yeah. yeah. Cool. yeah. No, so yeah, you, you basically have uh, a business that's half the size and twice as successful. Well, it's, yeah. a, it's a 16th of the size and um, <laughs> uh, success is still to be gauged. We will see. Cool. Um, now we know how that feels. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, well, that's kind of great. So why, um, out of all the very different types of scanning, mm-hmm. um, why are you picking the 3D 60, 360 shots and those specific types? Okay, um, so, well, um, I guess... Uh, to start, you need to sort of define 3D scanning. Yeah, and sure. um, people uh, incorporate things like 360 imagery as uh, a kind of under that header. Um, yeah. It's referred to a lot uh, as virtual reality. You can put a headset on with a 360 image and you can look around. But it, I wouldn't really class it as 3D scanning yeah. per se. Uh, for me, the definition of a 3D scan would be... Um, a 3D model uh, of the geometry of a surface um, with or without a texture associated with that. Um, And so those kinds of models are best made uh, or using it, uh, depends on what your your goal is, but if you want to have high quality textures, then photogrammetry is a really, really good way of achieving that. If you want really, really high uh, geometric accuracy, then a laser scanner, or a LiDAR scanner, sort of depending on the subject, um, would be preferable, but those come at quite a big cost. So yeah. one of the cool things about photogrammetry as a technique is um, all you need is a camera, uh, computer, and yeah. just some patience. Mm. Um, but you, the, 
one of the nice things about it is you can always improve your camera, you can always improve your technique, and you can mm. uh, get better and better results without the cost of a laser scanner that could be over like fifty thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you're explaining to just before, but maybe do you want to briefly uh, explain the process of scanning a room with mm -hmm. a camera and what that okay. photogrammetry process yeah, is like? Yeah, cool. So, if you wanted to make a uh, digital copy of a room, uh, for example, for a virtual reality experience. Um, it depends on the room, but the basic principle is that you take photographs of every surface in the room. Um, you can, you can, uh, we should uh, have overlap between each of your uh, images. Um, because once you've taken all of those photographs and you feed them into the computer, um, the computer has to find matching points between them. Mm. And uh, once it's found those matching points, it can uh, uh, orient the data set of cameras in relation to each other um, using the intrinsic and extrinsic uh, values that you find in your camera and your lens. Um, and once you have those floating cameras, uh, you're able to do f deeper sort of matching algorithms and make uh, a dense cloud of points. And once you have that dense cloud of points, um, which is representative of the surface that you scanned, then you can turn that into a mesh and then you can texture that mesh. Um, it, sound, it all sounds very complicated. Yeah. But, but uh, you're basically a, taking like a, a, a collage mm. of, of the wall from photos and yeah. the, Effect the computer cool. software is stitching it all together. Yeah, it's like a really fancy panorama. Yeah, with yep. depth data, basically, yep. if, if I had to simplify it down. Mm. Yep. Um, and there's a lots of different programs that you can use uh, to process this data. Uh, my preference is uh, 3DF Zephyr, which is an uh, Italian-based uh, bit of software. Uh, and they provide awesome support for, um, for anyone who's just getting started. Um, some of the larger companies don't really spend the time with individuals to teach them mm. techniques and stuff, um, whereas the Zephyr guys are, are pretty on to it. That's okay. really cool. So I guess like the, it, it, is it umbrella? Mach, is it machine learning again, or is it just like advanced algorithms yeah, doing it's, that? Yeah, it's it's um, it's not so much machine learning. Uh, it's more um, feature detection. Yeah. Uh, so finding matching features mm. across um, images. Uh, and that is driven uh, by uh, contrast and uh, various other sort of yep. elements of the image. Um, you can have different sort of depths of uh, feature searching. Right. You can spend a long time trying to align a set of images to make a 3D model from them. Uh, but if you prepare your photos in such a way and your subjects is easy enough, you can limit that the time it takes by reducing those settings. Mm -hmm. You don't need the additional power because you're already pretty close. So I guess you're just trying to make it as uniform as possible for the computer to then understand yeah. what it's looking at. Yeah, and just absolutely. go in and just randomly take photos of stuff. So yeah, the computer's yeah. going to have a really hard time of matching. Exactly. So you want to make sure that uh, your exposure is the same across all your photos, that your settings don't vary too much. Um, you can mix different cameras and different lenses and stuff into the same data set, but it means it's just going to have the program will have to work harder to make those connections yeah. and build the thing that you want it to build. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, actually, I gave it a go once. I just downloaded an app on my phone and I was like, oh, yeah, I can scan this. I don't know what it was, a pen or whatever. I just mm -hmm. took a bunch of pictures around that. I was like, that didn't work. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's, 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 it's promoted as a very easy thing. Um, <laughs> It, yeah, it can be very difficult. It depends yeah. on the subject. Like a pen, because it's probably got a really smooth surface, yeah. there's not many features for it to lock onto. Uh, the other thing is reflections. If it's a shiny surface, then you're going to have the reflection of the lights in the room moving around as you move your camera sure. around. So all of, these things, all of these things amount to uh, noise. So like shadow and moving light across the surface. So there's different techniques that you can use to minimize yeah. that kind of... So what about... Um so I guess, yeah, a room is a little bit easier than static objects, but what about, say, capturing a person? Oh, okay, yeah, Or cool. um, someone who Good. might have a have to itch their nose halfway through you taking pictures of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with humans or anything living, uh, it's a nightmare. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can. I've seen people get results uh, by very quickly running around their person, taking photos with an individual camera, but 
nine times out of ten, uh, you're going to have problems. There'll be misalignment and stuff. And as you say, if someone like sneezes or touches their nose or whatever, then um, it's ruined, basically. Yeah. Uh, so the only real, the, the really effective way of doing this uh, is to have multiple cameras uh, in a sort of array. And you sync all of those cameras up. So they will fire at the same time with the lights going off and everything. Uh, so that you can, um, yeah, capture that a moment in time where they're not going to be moving around. Sure. Uh, you can freeze extreme motion with um, super fast lights. Uh, so say, for example, if you had a dancer and the dancer is jumping up in the middle of the room, sure. um, if you want to get that motion, uh, you would need to have quite a um, uh, expensive setup to, to, yeah. to have lights that powerful and have cameras mm. which you're going to be able to resolve enough detail to make a model from it's totally possible but yeah. it's expensive it yeah. reminds me of actually like um, the Matrix you know when they that when they do that shot and they jump in midair mm. and they're yeah. each other yeah. that was done like that with a huge rig of cameras but yeah. obviously it's not a 3D model but they're just using each camera for each like fra- frame of the shot of the movie so it like looks like it's slow motion they're hovering which yeah. is pretty clever yeah, no, but similar sort of thing. Yeah, it is. It is similar. It is similar. It's basically just a matter of timing. That's all it is. Mm-hmm. If they had had all those cameras going for the same time, then they might have been able to extract some kind of three D data out of it. Yeah. yeah. Fun fact that um, <laughs> that that rooftop scene. Uh, I think pretty much everything is three D in that, which was mind blowing. Really? Because you look back yeah. on that and you're like, okay, yeah. So some of the effects were a bit naff in that movie, but that you never think that. Everything. That whole rooftop is just yeah no so impressive. Was that did you see that was on the Coral Crew? Cor- I think I might have seen it on yeah. Coral Crew. Yeah, that's yeah, like, yeah. That's so good. Such a good channel. I know reviewing yeah. that, and it was amazing. It's like just that highlight of like if you do something, you know, yeah, if you're doing something simple and with the right lighting, you can make like even back then, like it's such an old movie, make yeah. something so realistic. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's amazing. Yeah, and that's just because the pictures they're using are photorealistic. Yeah, which is um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it just goes to show how easily us as humans can be tricked into thinking something is real. Yeah. We're idiots. Yeah, we are, we are idiots. <laughs> We're idiots. But you know what's stupid? The people who make those ridiculous movies which we know aren't real. They are bad idiots. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Amateurs, a lot of them. <laughs> so, okay, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, so we're talking sort of rooms, we've got people, but yeah. who is actually your average client? Okay. Like, who's, who, who's paying you to do this stuff? It's tough to say who the average client is just because um, the, I mean, the income and the clients is relatively like volatile in terms of like what I'm doing and when I'm doing it. Mm. Um, I think some of my favorite stuff and some of the stuff that has come up the most often is museum-based things um, and anything that is to do with sort of uh, environmental... Well, I mean, I, I enjoy doing environmentally-based stuff. Uh, so, for example, I did a piece... A bunch of uh, 3D scans of bird legs for the Department of Conservation, and they were then printed uh, as one to one copies of the actual bird legs Mm -hmm. and sewn into um, like plushy uh, birds, which were representative of like actual birds. And so, these bird banding volunteers uh, for Doc they would practice on these legs rather than going out to the field and accidentally breaking a bird's leg if they break a print then not so bad arguably not, so bad. not as bad arguably not as bad and it yeah. also kind of like helps to highlight who is the most kind of like <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> don't awesome. to do the bands yeah no no, that, no you can do some paperwork instead no. <laughs> that's great yeah, yeah so I think yeah that's, that's great but then other museum stuff like there's a new exhibit I can't remember what it's called exactly but there's a whole bunch of bird uh, bones and stuff oh what's um, it called yeah, love it. The new Tepuffa the new exhibit. Yep. Um, so there's a giant moa pelvis there, and uh, it's got some eagle claw damage. Mm-hmm. And um, I had the privilege of scanning that original piece so that they could make a, uh, a reproduction out of it, routed out of wood, um, so people could touch it and stuff, which is oh. really cool. Um, yeah. I really like that kind of stuff because it, I don't know, just thinking about your thing, like, I'm not dead yet, but I've got things that are in a museum. So that's yeah. kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah well, sure. There's like permanence to it. I mean, mm. the thing that like, I love about 3D scanning is that you are capturing real life in a way. You know, mm. you are capturing real life and I mean, you know, 
photography was a big breakthrough don't get me wrong but like mm. the fact that you're actually catching something in real time that you or it's one moment mm. in time that you actually can analyze from every angle mm. and that's it's quite a cool thing and like to immortalize these um things from museums and things like yeah, that to actually have yeah. them online um yeah. and, and, you know in theory you know well, yeah, yeah yeah i mean it's quite a big task because there's quite like a large collection of mm. things in any museum i'd imagine um but what i've so I think now they're starting to do a lot of stuff in-house, mm-hmm. um, which is not so great for me as an independent businessman, yeah. but um, it's really good to see that they're taking it quite seriously as, yeah. a, as a, a method well, of archiving. And it's that kind of thing, right? Like, all ships rise with the tide. Like, yeah. the more that people are talking about 3D scanning and mm. seeing it as an option, it's great for you. Yeah, no, absolutely, right? absolutely. I, I, I look forward... Uh, to having more competition in the field because at the moment I don't really want to be spending money on advertising. But if someone else wants to jump into the game in Wellington and start advertising the hell out of 3D printing, that will be yeah. good for everyone, I think, at yeah. least in the beginning. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay, well, so yeah, that's, yeah, I guess, the average client. What about the mm. best client? <laughs> <laughs> the best client. Oh, I've got some good ones. Uh, well, most the interesting job, maybe, not best client. Yeah, you know, okay. Most that's, interesting that can be different job. Things, that's true most interesting job um what well, can i talk about that's the yeah. trick because <laughs> a lot of these or a lot of the really interesting jobs you have to sign on disclosure agreements mm. for just a shame scanning out of your bodies and and yeah, yeah 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 we'll edit that out what? yeah um, um but uh, what about that muscle the muscle oh uh, yeah so one of the first jobs that one of the first big jobs that i did was for uh Cawthron, uh which is down in nelson and they're like a scientific institute and they wanted a 3D scan of a muscle line. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, a, a rope with uh, those muscles that you can eat uh, attached to it in the water. Um, and there'll be like massive farms of these muscle lines and they'll get dragged ashore. So, what they wanted was a 3D model one so that they could measure the drag coefficient of this muscle line as it was being hauled to shore, mm. um, which I suppose kind of uh, the knock on effect of that research is that they can. Uh, perhaps modify how the muscle lines are brought in to save on fuel. Yeah. Uh, and if you roll that out across the entire industry, um, it's massive. Big yeah. savings. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so what I find is I do a lot of jobs where I don't necessarily know much at all about what it's for. Yeah. All I'm doing is providing a as close as possible uh, dimensionally digital accurate model. Like, digital model. So, yeah, it's all kinds of weird stuff coming through. But isn't there? Like, as soon as you can get physical things into the computer, then you can start analysing them and, you know, mm. pulling things off them. And that's, I mean, for engineers and anyone, designers, architects, that's all super helpful, you know? I mean, yeah, It's totally. all good when you're building something new, you know, yeah. which you have a model of, but, you know, yeah. there's so many things in the, in the world that don't have computer models of them. I do a, I do a lot of, like, uh, ref- CAD reference models. Yeah. So, yeah, basically just complex curves that people can't... Mm easily make on the computer themselves yeah um it's a really good start point yeah it's like um like you know car car designers and stuff still use clay modeling and whatnot because you can have so much better control over the form of the car Mm. when you're doing it physically and then they'll scan that model back into the scan that physical model back into the computer and then turn Mm. that into their model that they mass manufacture Mm. because that's the best way to get that controlled surface and i don't think anytime soon anyone's going to make a better way of controlling surfaces with that sort of fidelity than yeah. in real life you know mm. absolutely yeah. Yeah. although I guess with these uh, the rise of the VR headset and having control True. in virtual reality I think that's going to become less and less of a craft is making things with uh, like some making sculptures and things out of clay and physical mm-hmm. materials and I think part of that is I mean like I mean it's hard to say because the cost of headsets is so high at the moment but once the cost of a headset outweighs the cost of materials, yeah, that's when you'll start to see a lot of people switching over because it won't make any economic sense to do it in clay. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. So, right. It's like ZBrush and all sort of stuff. Eh? Yeah, I guess haptic feedback. ZBrush, ZBrush part as well. program with the worst in the face in the <laughs> yeah. history of the world. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I, I opened it a couple of times, but I <gasps> never. Yeah, it's it's always it's always scared me. I always send that work to other people. I'm, yeah, I've tried to learn it three times and each time yeah. pretty much just given up. Well, you can spread yourself real thin over 3D programs because they can be quite complex. Oh, yeah. For sure. And yeah. if you can do everything in one program, that's like, the that's the goal, right? It's, yeah. Well, yeah, and then, I guess so, yeah. Mm. It'd been, I guess it's, it's easy to become adept at a program, but mm. it can take 
I mean, we've learned uh, Rhino, for example, but yeah. we've been on there for about five, More six five years. years. Is it longer than that? Yeah, but I mean, seven years. There's still so many tools we know nothing about. You know? Yeah. Just Has Rhino changed much over time, or is it pretty uh, similar? Not a lot. The core is still the same, okay. but um, there's better functions, you know. But yeah. what it does is the same. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's mostly just yeah, tweaks and improvements. But there's things like uh, like the parametric modeling stuff that's coming in, which is mm. basically in, in leveraging Grasshopper and stuff like that. Like that's that's super interesting. Yeah, sure. Grasshopper is a rendering engine, right? It, no, Grasshopper is no. like the um, uh, parametric modeling. So it's like you you have your little. Um, algorithm or whatever and say oh, okay. like um oh, if i make the angle of this wood or, or this bend so much then it's going to change everyone after that oh, so gotcha. it's like um yeah creating so kind of, definitions and rules yeah. and stuff and you can sort of, kind of well, like influence weight across yep. like yep. subject. so if so you like were if you're designing a chair for example you can say you could type in the guy's height or oh, his weight yeah, yeah, and yeah. it might Make the, legs make the legs longer and um, increase the lumbar support or you know cool. based on all the rules that you've made within this grasshopper yeah. um, definition yeah. thing I think that's the way that the world is you know going is that you know yeah. every, with computers learning and all the rest of it and rapid rapid prototyping like mm. why not everyone have a unique thing because you know once 3D printers become faster and cheaper it's as easy to make a different thing as it is to make the same thing. Mm. And it's one of those things that... Economies of scale. Economies of scale. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's going to be pretty exciting times, I guess. But it's for 3D scanning is another thing. I mean, I suppose you scan things and then if you can somehow make them manipulatable, I guess. Mm. Can... Yeah, I mean, that, that is, that's uh, an ongoing problem uh, for me uh, is that the 3D scans that I create are sort of static meshes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when I have a client uh, that needs this model for whatever program, be it Rhino or um, I don't know, whatever one, SolidWorks, mm, uh, yeah. they will struggle to use that file because they need to then convert it to services or whatever yeah. it is yeah. has to be converted yeah. to. And that's kind of a bit of a pain point because uh, they didn't pay me to do that, yeah. they paid me to do a scan. But there's yeah. this expectation. Yeah, they're um, just misunderstood. They mis yeah. yeah, and so that's that. Uh, effectively, that just boils down to I need to be more explicit in what yeah. I'm providing. And I, yeah. and I do try and be as explicit as possible, but usually um, there's the person that I'm talking to isn't necessarily the person who's receiving the file. Yeah. So they don't yeah. understand the yeah. sure. pitfalls of it. Yeah. You know yeah. I mean? And if that's the thing, like, you need a relatively good understanding of the difference between mesh and um, you know, service mode based modeling. And that's it. You know, obviously yeah. what you're doing is great for you know, visualizations, mm. game assets, yeah. you know, this sort of stuff. Um, but not but, great for engineering models. No, not at all. I mean, it's it's good as a reference. Yeah, as a reference it's the best us. reference it could be, yeah. but it's, yeah, it's not a good end product. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to be able to work on a yeah. CNC um, machine. Well, then maybe you can. That's a yeah. lie. But, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it is so hard to explain to, uh, you know, everyone's going to have a client that uh, understands the bare basics of whatever it might be, but has no technical understanding. Mm. And it's like, it, it, it's only after the fact that they realise... Or do and do you realize that exactly where the miscommunication was and yeah. um, how little they knew about this thing? One yeah. thing at some points because sometimes they yeah. lead on that they actually ah oh, yeah yeah no three D yeah. scanning oh, don't yeah, worry no, about totally. that totally yeah I've done that before on my yeah, phone yeah, yeah. 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 So it's like I know that it's yeah like, just oh. whip one up please and you give it to them like what's yeah. this why doesn't it move and it's like, no. oh. <laughs> so one of the things that I used to do a lot more was 3D printing. Um, mm -hmm. I don't do that now uh, because the cost of machines is prohib prohibitively high and the materials are expensive and it takes a long time to fix a model up to a point where it's ready yeah. to print. Sure. And so um, people generally aren't willing to pay for that part. They just want a cheap 3D print. Yeah. And it just wasn't really working as a business model for me. Yeah, I mean, sure. I'm sure people will find success in that particular field. But, but that's the perception there, right? It's the same yeah. work at Weta. It was The perception was you could go control P. So, mm. like, there is, um, no, yeah. you know, you get a 3D model. It's like, cool, uh, that looks yeah. all good on the screen. Uh, mm. Print it. It's like, no, no, no. Like, yeah. this is not printable whatsoever. I'll, yeah. I'll get a lot of files like that from, um, I guess you could regard, regard them as legacy 3D providers. Um, like they will have throughout mm. their entire uh, the service history um, they've not had to worry about the structural integrity of their files because they haven't been printing them mm. yeah. and um, a lot of the time 
there will just be so many things wrong with it. <laughs> and then people will feel a little insulted when you say, oh, this is not right. And they're like, no, it is right. Like, uh, this, I've made 3D models for 10 years. And, blah, blah, blah. and like, well, actually, I'm sorry. It's just like not spec for printing. There's holes in it. Some of the normals are flipped either way. If, uh, it's just there's so many potential. Yeah, it has been made with the intention of yeah, printing totally, it. Yeah, totally, totally. But yeah, sure. That's part of the reason I don't do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, mean, I outsource good. it to people yeah. because other, and, I, and, I, and I, when I outsource it to people, I sort of try and make sure that whatever I'm providing them is perfect. Yeah. Obviously, I still make mistakes. We're all human. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but I guess, like you say, if you want to have a good 3D printing business, it probably <coughs> is the case of we print what you send us, and if we can't print it, keep doing it until we can print it, and then we'll print it, you know what I mean? So that's yeah. probably how they, yeah. they're just trying to cut out all that. You know, mm. that mess at the start you know well one of the really big successful I think successful companies is Shapewave yeah um, I think they're based in New York and yeah. I've got some prints from them a few times they're reliable they're expensive but I mean it's okay yeah mm. yeah <laughs> no, they provide a great service and yeah. it's 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 funny about Shapeways too because they've built it around this model of making it as simple as control P. Mm. Like mm. you upload your model, it tells yeah. you what's wrong with it, print it, and then you just get it back. Yeah. You know, and they like, just automate so much of that yeah, diagnosis so yep. of the file. Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah, that's so clever how they've done that. And you know, for a lot of people it's you know, just how they understand it. Like, oh mm. cool, you get back a model just like it on the screen. Yeah. But and then like what you don't see behind the scenes is the incredible amount of cleanup mm. and that goes on is like yeah. they've got a very small printing facility apparently but then they've got like four warehouses full of people like cleaning up all the support lines mm, yeah. and like getting their files and everything like that and yeah like that's huge one of the interesting things about shapeways and their tolerances and what they will accept as a file um they're actually they give themselves quite a bit of a buffer yeah. in terms mm-hmm. of like what's actually achievable <laughs> and what they were willing to do for people because like you say with the cleanup and stuff yeah I'm sure they've got massive amounts of people working on it, it just takes so long per oh, model yeah. and if you've got really thin walls on something yeah. and you're trying to depowder the inside of it and then you your brush goes through a wall yeah that's a couple yeah. hundred dollars maybe just gone exactly uh, and just material costs yeah. like it can be really expensive um, so I used to run a really expensive 3D printer. It was about eighty thousand dollars. It was a full color uh, sure. gypsum printer, right. and uh, I did a couple of extreme jobs on it. Um, one of those jobs was for Ghost in the Shell. Um, it was yep. the underlying geisha masks. Right. Um, it was for uh, sort of. I think it was for special effects, and they were they went on and shattered all of these masks that I made and strewn all the bits over the floor and stuff as yeah. sort of like dressing. Um, but the tolerances that I managed to print with that machine were like half the, um, half of the dimensions of what you can print through Shapeways. Yeah. Mm. Um, but that's the only way you can make it a successful business model is to just limit people. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, we print, as soon as a print fails, like again, the same thing, like, mm. it's, it's not just that you have human error, but obviously the machine, the, the, the more you push it to the limits, the more likely it is to fail. Yeah, and totally. if you fail, Absolutely. you come back to a whatever, a bird's nest or yeah. a whatever. And there's all these all moving parts gone. if you don't do, yeah, a daily maintenance on yeah. that. Yeah, it's a lot harder than, than people think. <laughs> yeah. <it really laughs> Funny is. that, yeah. It's a general theme to things. <laughs> And there's also sort of like pre-existing distribution networks as well. So with a lot of the printers, they will have, um, there'll be a reseller in a country. So for example, 3D Systems in New Zealand, the reseller, at least traditionally, was Fuji Xerox. I don't know whether or not that's still the case. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but there are, it's, it can be difficult to even get a printer into the country. Yeah, yeah. Like well, especially New Zealand, though, it's so yeah. far away and these massive, expensive machines. Yeah. It's like I think the universities probably spend the most money on them, or like the like Callahan Research. I know they've got quite a lot of yeah. nice printers. There's some great printers there, yeah. uh, but they're really good for supporting like the local community and yeah. small businesses and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. nice yeah. guys there. Yeah, they're pretty good. Um, well, as, yeah, I mean, I, one thing I do want to ask on still on the list is yeah. just about the the kind of the future of mm. 3D scanning. And I mean, if you're anything right. like us, thinking about almost the future of your industry. Yeah. And uh, what what are the threatening things there and what are the like really exciting, exciting things? Exciting things. 
Let's start with the exciting thing. Yeah, that's yeah. nice. Yeah. Let's finish on the end, end, end of the man note. <laughs> um, so the, the, the thing that I'm most excited about is a is what I imagine to be a transition from photographs of products for e-commerce to 3D models of products for yeah, e-commerce. Yeah, right. right. It's such a massive industry mm. selling stuff yeah. to people. Um, and rather than having five or six photos all around the model if you have a 3d model of it then you really get a sense of what it actually looks like like that cool pair of shoes that you see if you can spin them around on your computer screen uh, or even maybe with uh, augmented reality point your your phone at your feet and see the shoes on your feet before you purchase it i think you're much more likely to buy it Uh, and you can sort of roll that theory out across the board and i know that lots of the large companies uh that sell say for example ikea um most of their collection is uh, all 3D models in their catalogs anyway. Yeah. They hardly do any photography, which yeah. is really interesting. Um, but I think that they might have an app, or maybe it's another company. I know like Wayfair is another furniture sure company. I guess they have a website. And that's just a sign of sort of like things to come. I think it's going to, the, the, the difficulty of uh, four companies to achieve yeah. that. They won't need internal teams. They'll be able to go to a bureau and yeah, sure. will make the scans for them pretty much on the spot and then they can catalogue those. Yeah. Um, and then with a little bit of work, say for example, if you, you had six different types of one chair, you could scan one chair and then change the colour on it six yeah. times. And that means you only have to do one scan but you get three different create or however many different creative like different individual cushion things. Cushion colours or whatever. Yeah, exactly, you know, exactly. Yeah. Which kind of rolls into the procedural stuff. Yeah. Which uh, I guess could be overlaid relatively easily. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's the positive stuff. Negative stuff. Go on. <laughs> Negative stuff. Uh, I don't know. I don't think there's um, anything that strikes me as particularly scary about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think something that people might be concerned about is like privacy and IP and stuff like that. I think IP is actually probably quite a big issue or could be a big issue. Because if you start to, if you copy someone else's work, say someone's done a sculpture, it's in the middle of town, and you scan it, yeah. and you put it online as like a yeah. as an asset for people to buy. I mean, it's a bit of a minefield in terms of what you can and can't get away with. Um, and then I guess the other thing is if you're scanning humans, or if you have a scan done of yourself, what kind of rights are you signing away? What can yeah. your body yeah. be used for? Yeah. Um, and I know with what was it Ready Player One when they were when they were signing up people to be in that movie they did a whole bunch of body scans if I remember correctly, um, but part of the body scan sort of disclaimer was that uh, you would be you could be used in any number of feature films like down the line by just Warner as an Brothers asset. or whatever. Yeah, it was. yeah. So I guess you could just be a face in a crowd that would be like a crowd simulation that's thrown into a wow. you know, whatever. So. Um, I don't know, I remember there was a bit of like backlash from uh, a few people about that because obviously mm. it's uh, it's quite invasive. Yeah, sure. Um, but then you've got the beautiful side of that, which is when you if you have a person who's died, uh, like a mm-hmm. like a beloved celebrity, um, they can be digitally reinserted into a movie, and they can like was it Fast and the Furious or yeah. uh, with um, I can't remember his name Paul Walker. Paul Walker, that's the one. Yeah, and the new Will Smith movie. There's um, young Will Smith fighting old Will Smith. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you can do all those fa- fancy effects with like Benjamin, uh, the Curious Case of yeah. Ben. Curious Case of Ben. Ben Curious Case of Ben. Would, would you yeah. get a place on the credits? I don't know. That's probably, my question. It though. would probably. Uh, <laughs> uh, ben, sure. Highly <laughs> unlikely. Highly unlikely. Yeah. Because I mean, like, I've done work on movies and you won't find movies in the credits. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, five years. <laughs> that's, that's the thing, see, like. If, yeah. yeah, and it, I mean. Especially if you're like a subcontractor or whatever, yeah, yeah. you're never gonna get. If you're just a, if you're just a face in a crowd, yeah. you're not gonna get. Well, I heard apparently that like that was, yeah, like some of those crowd simulations, like obviously before the technology was like Lord of the Rings, for example. I don't know if it's specifically Lord of the Rings, but mm. all those like people are just like Brad Pitt or something because they have like a perfectly rigged uh, yeah, model yeah. and really accurate version of like Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise and stuff like yeah. that. So they just buy that asset and then chuck it into their automation simulations yeah. or whatever. That's so cool. they're all just like the standard mail, but they're actually just like an army of Brad Pitt. Dressed up like a guy. Yeah, yeah, that's so interesting, eh? Yeah. yeah. No, there's so many different things you can do with 3D scans. Yeah. That's part of the reason why I 
focus on 3D scanning uh, was because it's like the basis for so many different industries. Mm. Yeah. And um, I'd much rather be at that end of the funnel than going hyper, hyper niche. Because I feel like I'm already pretty niche in what I'm doing. <laughs> so if it's to go any deeper, uh, it would be a bad You're thing. so right though. It's the root of so many industries mm. now. Like, um, and it's, you know, you see all these incredible um, Unreal Engine uh, VR experiences now mm. and walkthroughs and stuff. And all the best stuff is, if not completely um, scanned, mm. um, just the, the elements, are scanned, uh, yeah, elements are just uh, put in that are scanned. So like the occasional... Um, concrete tile or wall panel and things mm. like that and it just brings the entire scene to life yeah like it's, yeah, it's, no, it's so much more realistic than anything that you can come up with or like copy yeah or make or, or make, make it yeah 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 and i think a part of that is sort of say for example if you you can generate rocks mm -hmm. in a computer program yeah. just because there's such a i mean like uh, there's not that much to understand no is there, like there's something a bit of variation in shape lots of like small noise detail for the surface that kind of thing but nothing beats real world reference yeah. yeah because you will end up with the same looking kind of rock and you won't necessarily be able to pinpoint why does it look the same as mm. those other rocks but it's because it's just come out of a limited variation system yeah yep. whereas we live in a incredibly diverse world yeah and um, there's so many different flavors of things yeah um, <laughs> humans are a great example of that there's a lot of different body shapes and face shapes and hair and stuff like that. Yeah. So. Yeah, the VR scans is yeah, one like an online library for that is that it's like just real world scans. Is it called VR scans? VR scans. Yep. That's yeah. what we use though. But um mm. yeah, for like games and stuff again, mm. like you know, making a perfectly beautiful fern mm. so long. But you know what I mean? You scan a fern or you scan yep. a log. It's like it looks yep. amazing. Like so mega scans. Mega scans, yeah. that's it. That that um that sort of raises the point of Star Wars, Battlefront. The, yeah. Mm, oh, yeah, the latest, yeah, yeah. I think maybe even they released another one. Um, Battlefront 2. Yeah, so, I don't know, but yeah. They, they used a lot of photogrammetry um, yeah. for the assets and that, and it looks phenomenal. Yeah. Like, oh, mind blowingly good. Yeah. Because um, a, yeah. a lot of people are saying about that game, like, it wasn't that fun. People didn't really enjoy the game as much, no. but they loved being in the game. Yeah. Like, as far as in the forests of Endor or whatever yeah, it was, they're just yeah. like, this is awesome. Oh. Um, it goes a yeah. long way to add to the emotion. Yep. But as you say, it doesn't necessarily make a good game. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, yeah. If it's uh, if it's a, if it's got a bad storyline or whatever, yeah. it has bad game bad mechanics. Can't well, really save, you can't save it with some British. You're not reliable for the, yeah. the plot. You yeah, 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 yeah. I'm only like five percent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With Battlefront was all the um, all the in game purchases. And that's what ruined it. Why yeah. not? Because yeah. you're paying like yeah. hundred twenty dollars. I don't play Darth Vader. Twenty dollars more, yeah. you know. Some of the some of the maths on it until like unlock all of it. It was gonna be like thousands. Something stupid. Yeah. Like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's money growing. Bastards. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what, what a catch. If Disney didn't own enough. Uh, yeah. Star Wars yeah. is yeah. a franchise. Yeah. I just love it. Yeah. yeah. But now I just don't care. I know. You can ask a question now. Um, if, if you have to live on a Star Wars planet, which one would you live on? Oh, you got is that a, is that a standard question? It's, it's a thing we've always done. I think you've always done. My favorite Star Wars planet to live on. To live on, oh, yeah, probably you're stuck there. Probably, yeah, probably. Yeah, just because there's so much stuff going on. Yeah, I just yeah. want to be a bit too much of a rat race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe. No, yeah, yeah. No. I mean, it's just a giant city. Yeah, it's that's it true. Is. Yeah. The well, how about you guys? Where, where would you want to be? I don't know um, what was now. I, think, oh, I like the Wookiee planet. Um, Kashyyyk. Dagobah. No way. Kashyyyk. Oh, yeah. Or Dagobah is the one there with the swamp and the. Yeah, that's Yoda. Oh, that's Yoda. Yeah. No, 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 stinky swamp for you. I think living, yeah. after living in Athlet, I think Hoth would be fine. Hoth? Yeah, yeah okay. I, think, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I reckon I could cope. Just one of the big bunkers. Yeah, and then like, they have one of those things that runs around on two legs. Yeah. Like, I mean, that'd be great. Like an AT-AT? No, 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 no the, 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 the creature that you cut open and jump oh, inside and it's really cold. Yeah, I know what you mean. A tut, 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 Oh, wait, man. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, cool. yeah. Thanks for coming on, Cameron. It's, no, it's, been, good. A, it's been a pleasure. Um, yeah. yeah, I had a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, good yeah. Days, mate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, who knows what we, who we've got on next week, or um, if anyone will ever want to come on ever again. But um, <laughs> we will um, see you next week, and uh, thanks for joining us. Bye. See ya.